So good morning, brothers and sisters. Shall we seek the Lord's guidance today as we open his word and see and seek what the book of Joshua 18 has for us? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for all that you are doing in our lives. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to gather together so that we may open your word, so that we may be guided by that which you would have us to understand. Be with us, please, Father. We need your instruction. We need your guidance. We need your wisdom. There are many things within these books that we do not fully understand. Especially, we need to understand what these books mean for our time. I thank you for those that have come to this study. I thank you for those that will view this study later in the recording. Help us now. Be with us so that your will is done. For this we thank you, and for this we praise you, now and always, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Before you are the notes on Joshua 18. Now, as, as we're about to go into this, this is going to be the next step in our studies. Because... We're looking at this in the book of Joshua to see what items can be gleaned that are prevalent and relevant for our time. So as the translator's notes would show us, in the opening verse, we have the tabernacle being set up at Shiloh. Joshua causes the remainder of the land not yet divided to be described into seven parts. The description is made and brought to Joshua. He distributes the land there by lot, the lot and the border of the children of Benjamin, and the cities of the children of Benjamin. So as we open this up, Joshua 18, verse 1. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. And the land was subdued before them. And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes, which had not yet received their inheritance. Now, as we look at the, at the first cross-reference that we're given, the verses that are presented by the translators begin at Joshua 19, verse 51, so the following chapter. These are the inheritances which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel divided for an inheritance by lot in Shiloh before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the con congregation. So they made an end of dividing the country. Now, throughout this, we see that the portion of the country that was to the east of the Jordan had been apportioned by Moses. In the last couple of studies, we've also seen that the tribe of Manasseh requested additional territory. Here, by lot, the tribes are brought together. By lot, the rest of the land is being divided. The translators continued. They used Joshua 21, verse 2. And they spake unto them at Shiloh in the land of Canaan, saying, The Lord commanded by the hand of Moses to give us cities to dwell in, and the suburbs thereof for our cattle. 
we find that these cities are what we would consider small towns. And as I would look to understand this, the suburbs would be the land around the towns, an area for their flocks, for their herds, for them to graze in, for them to raise these animals. Yes. Now, when we hear the word suburbs in the modern sense, it's like another city connected to a larger city. If I was to use Seattle as an example, Bellevue could be regarded as a suburb of Seattle. If I use Los Angeles, the Simi Valley could be regarded as a suburb. Here, suburb is looked upon in a very different manner. Joshua 22.9 is next. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel out of Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go under the country of Gilead into the land of their possession, whereof they possessed according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. In this verse, again, we see a doubling to the land of their possession whereof they were possessed. So this returning, this going to the east has some interrelation with the second angel's message. Anybody have any thoughts as to why this would be the case? Okay. <clears throat> Jeremiah 7 verse 12 was the next one. But ye, but go ye now unto my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. Shiloh is shown as being a location and a point of assembly. But Jeremiah is reminding them that when the children of Israel go unto Shiloh, unto his place, which was in the past, not in the current, but in the past in Shiloh, where I set, where I set my name at the first, where I initially have my name, and see what I did for the wickedness of my people Israel. Would it seem from this verse that God first was in communion with the people at Shiloh and now, according to Jeremiah, that he has turned his back upon Shiloh? because of the, the wickedness of the people? His rejection of uh, Shiloh is typifying his, if he, don't, if he does it with Shiloh, he'll do it with Jerusalem. Exactly. And so if, he's, if he is turning his back upon Shiloh, turning his back upon Jerusalem, literally turning his back upon Jerusalem, as we see occurred in 31 AD, would it be that he would turn his back upon the spiritual Jerusalem today? A 
Okay, in the chat, in, in the chat, we're receiving a, a suggestion to look at Isaiah 8, verse 6. Sister Angela, could you please read that for us? Okay, it says, for as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh, that's a Shiloh that goes softly, and rejoice in reason and Remaliah's son. So the people chose worldliness rather than worldly power and military might over having a relationship with Christ. Okay. Did you have something further to add, Brother Stephen? I just thought Shiloh uh, that uh, Angela mentioned that that means sent. And we find that in John chapter five, I think. Okay. Um, uh, the Shiloh, I think, has a different meaning, even though it's quite similar in the spelling. Uh, Shiloh means peace, bringer of prosperity, tranquility, rest. Okay, so in this in this situation, we have these two similar yet dissimilar meanings. Because if Shiloh is peace and rest, we wind up with something in addition to the blessing that is given upon the tribe of Judah. Because we understand that the lawgiver shall not depart from between his feet until Shiloh come, until peace or rest has come. Shiloh then would be that which is sent. Could we then address this situation that Shiloh could typify prophets of old? Could this typify Elijah? Could this typify John the Baptist? Could this typify William Miller or Elder Jeff? Here's a message, a message that is sent to the world. We know that the first, second, third angel's messages are sent to the world. We know that the world many will not be benefited by either the first or the second, but there will be those that will be benefited by both and then be benefited by the third. I believe we have all accepted that we are in the time of the other angel, the Revelation 18 angel, which means that we're in the time of the repeat of the second angel of Revelation 14. But if we're repeating the Revelation 14 second angel, we are not yet in the time of the third angel. And we need to fully understand what is being presented here so that we can become like Shiloh, so that we can become sent. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. And Christ himself was called the scent of God. So we're supposed to be becoming more and more like him. And then he'll be entrusted with more power to preach the message. Agreed. Okay, now. As that verse had continued. So, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. 
what I found interesting that was given to us for examples. Judges 18.31. Now we've, we covered this portion of Judges in a Sabbath morning study not that long ago. Here we have Judges 18, verse 31. And they set them up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. What was this tribe doing in setting up this graven image? I mean, the comparison is that the tabernacle has been set up in Shiloh. The tabernacle has been erected as the place for the children of Israel to worship. Yet this tribe is choosing to set up a graven image in competition with Shiloh. So what's happening here? And what's its relevance for us today? Well, it's um, apostasy. Agreed. Now, at this time, we have had some that are being enchanted by the smooth message that has been coming out from some very popular pastors. I know of a pastor within the conference in which I live that went to a member, a friend of mine, when this friend was studying the charts, when he was going deeper into the word, this pastor approached him and told him very directly, in order to study the word, you need to become an expert in Greek and Hebrew. You are not an expert in Greek and Hebrew. Therefore, you need someone that is an expert in Greek and Hebrew to explain to you what the word really says. I am an expert in Greek and Hebrew. Therefore, you need me to tell you what the Bible says. How would you approach something like that? What would your reaction be if you were confronted in this manner? Well, Ellen White, she says, that it's okay maybe have some people knowing Greek and Hebrew, but nobody really needs uh, to to understand their languages, to understand the Bible. Okay. Now, have we not accepted that the word of God is simple enough that a child can understand it. Yet it is deep enough that the great minds can find truth in ways if they apply themselves properly, that they can find truths that they never expected to find? I mean, I'm, I'm constantly amazed 
by some of the, the work that other brothers and sisters are doing with some of these charts, some of these amazing, simple, logical presentations that show just how valid the time periods and the way marks really are. That last chart that you sent out on the WhatsApp, Stephen, I, I'm just, I, I'm still just gobsmacked from it. I mean, it just amazes me that this is not more prevalent and more visible to those that are within the church. I praise God that he led you to this. Because it is so, so very simple that any child could understand exactly why October 22nd, 1844 is so very important. But here we have this situation. We have this situation where apostasy is occurring. Leaven is being introduced by one tribe, and they are setting up a graven image. They are choosing to turn their back upon true worship to worship according to their own hearts. <clears throat> and this is not something that we should be looking to do. We cannot afford to worship according to how man tells us. When this pastor made this comment to my friend, I got a little incensed. When I was a child, I was raised as a Lutheran. As a Lutheran, you come to understand what it means to be a Protestant. Now, that may not be the case now, many years later, but it was for me at that time. We understood what we were protesting and why we were protesting. We today cannot afford to be apostate. Time is too short. First Samuel one verse three. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. Here we are speaking of Elkanah. He has gone up yearly to worship in Shiloh. And we are introduced to Eli and Phineas. Okay. A comment has been made that we should refer to Psalms 5521. Now again, Sister Angela, could you read that for us, please? Um, the words of his mouth were smoother than butter but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they drawn swords. Beware of false teachers is what I'm trying to say. Right. So if the words are smoother than butter, that's an interesting allegorical representation, but war was in his heart. So who are the false teachers choosing to fight against? The Lord. Is there any way that we can fight against the Lord? Not successfully. Not at all. So, and I, I agree. The graven images can include the inscribed words in books of the new order 
that the mainstream church seems to be pouring out. Several years ago, as I was beginning to study the 1888 message, I had conversations with a friend who is the son of a pastor that worked and worked in this area for quite a number of years. His understanding of the 1888 message is, is very deep. But his father, years before, would attend different camp meetings. And at those camp meetings, you had a group of then young, untested ministers. And among this group were Morris Venden, his brother, many others that all assembled and they were addressing what they were seeing from the works of Jones and Wagner. I received an audio recording that I had found of the 1952 General Conference session, which was a session at which Morris Venden did not present, but he did sing. My first introduction to what Pastor Venden had presented was occurring in 1976 and 1977. And it was a message unlike anything that I had heard to that time within the church. To look at and to understand righteousness by faith was something that Morris Venden was told was going to lead him into apostasy. Because the example was given that if this message had led Elliot Wagner and A.T. Jones into apostasy, it will surely lead you into apostasy. Therefore, you need to stay away from the message of righteousness by faith. So in 1952, the church was warning ministers, warning those that they were training, that they needed to stay away from what Ellen White said was the message of the third angel in verity. Was this not apostasy? It's insanity. I heard somebody tell me once in church, and this is a high-ranking brother, that if I studied the Bible too much, I would go insane. Really? Wow. Yes. You know, with everything that's been going on within my life over the last couple of years, I have been favored with more time for Bible study, for contemplation. I find that there, there just seems never to be enough time for prayer. So it is something that needs to be done constantly and consistently. In every action, asking God, is this the way you would have me to walk? Is this the path on which I should walk? What am I to do? Now, we are soon to be confronted with those that have been within the church, that have been trained in spiritual formation, that have accepted spiritual formation. And these people are going to look upon the messages as they are given as being delusions. Those that give this message will be treated much like Elijah was treated. Very much 
like John the Baptist and directly like the Savior. First Samuel 1, verse 24. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks, with one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine, and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. Who is being described here? <coughs> From this portion of the book of Samuel, is this not the description of Samuel and his mother coming again before Eli? Yes. Is this not recognizing that she was giving a thank offering for the birth of this son, of this most desired son, and she was bringing it to the appointed church at that time? She was not bringing it to an idol. She was not bringing it to a graven image. She was bringing it before the appointed church, yet was this a pure church? Far from it. Okay. First Samuel 4, 3. And when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. The children of Israel knew better. But by this time, the apostasy that had begun with Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, had begun to permeate the hearts of those of the children of Israel, where they no longer respected that the ark was where God had been dwelling and was to be treated fearfully, now they, expect, they expected it just as an idol. Bring it. Put it before us. This is our symbol. This is our idol. This is what is going to turn the tide against the Philistines, against our enemies. Is this not what the church has done with worship on the Sabbath day? Have they not made this an idol rather than being a sacred rest day? How are we to approach this today? How are we to see this? As the translators continue, 1 Samuel 4, verse 4. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring forth thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. <coughs> now to me, This was an amazing time, a fearful time. Because these two men had not been restrained by their father to understand what true worship was about. Yet they were allowed to serve within the tabernacle at Shiloh.
these two men who in their hearts are shown as not truly worshiping God are being requested to bring the ark from Shiloh to the place of Bethel. Is this according to God's order? Should this have been done? Okay, <clears throat> comment from the chat. To a large extent, the world, non-SDA physicians, have captured the arc of our health message and are sharing it with the world. <clears throat> Any further thoughts on that? Any comments? I'm intrigued by, by the premise that's presented there because you do see that there are many right now within the world that are more true to this health message than what the church has been. <clears throat> this health message has become perverted within the church. We were addressing some of this on Sabbath. We go to a church that then offers a potluck, a communal meal. When they offer this, many times at these potlucks, we find that they are offering items that Ellen White tells us should never be on our table, that these items are unfit for human consumption. Sister White has a lot of counsel for us as to what we should eat. But I find many within the corporate church are more than willing to set aside her words, to set aside her counsel in this, because they believe that we have progressed so much further than at any other time of earth's history, that what she said at that point does not apply to us now. And that is a very fearful position to be taken. We cannot afford to turn our backs on the word of God. As did the children of Israel in the solemnity of what the ark was really meaning and the symbol of what the ark was to be. Now, the next verse that we get to is very much in line to what the presentation was on Sabbath. So this is one that we're going to have to consider and consider well for our day. Do we hold to a situation like this? Is this something that we see occurring within our lives? How are we to take this? <clears throat> Joshua 18.3. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, 
how long are ye slack to go to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you? Brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask you this question. As Joshua did for his time, as William Miller did for his, as Elder Jeff has begun in ours, <clears throat> how long will we be slack? Will we be indolent to go to possess the heavenly Canaan? Joshua saw that these tribes had chosen to set aside the word of God and were giving every excuse as to why they couldn't do what God had commanded them to do, even though God had given them the promise that these peoples that were before them would fall. How long are ye slack to go to possess the land? Consider, please, Judges 18, verse 9. And they said, Arise, that we may go up against them, for we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. And are ye still? Be not slothful to go and to enter to possess the land. Judges 18 verse 9 was the people of Dan deciding that our inheritance is too tough. Our inheritance is too hard. Let's go take somebody else's inheritance instead. somebody else's inheritance in our world is it not the consideration of the bible according to the methods that others use because william miller's rules they're just they're just too simple william miller was wrong therefore if we study according to these rules we're going to be wrong. So we've got to do where we can study and we can be right. We need to be just like everybody else. Otherwise, they're going to say we're a cult. Otherwise, they're, they're, they're going to look down upon us. We can't afford that. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, we're not the Philistines looking down upon Israel. We're not the Canaanites looking down upon them because they couldn't see the God of Israel. That Israel served an unseen God, yet they, they had been defeating these kings that were greater Okay, here again from the chat. First Kings 18.21, to be compared with Joshua 18.3. Can somebody read that for us, please? First Kings 18.21. It says, and Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long? Call he between two opinions. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. So in other words, many years later, during the reign of Ahab, Elijah repeats the message that Joshua had given at his time. Now, if Joshua was giving this message, let's say, 
1493, but say 1486, and we were to go to the time of Ahab, how many years technically would we be looking at? Would, be, would we be 500, 600 years later? Here is a repeat of the message. <clears throat> Joshua is saying, how long are you going to turn your back upon the promises of God? Elijah, how long halt ye between two opinions? How long are you going to be on the fence? How long are you going to ignore the word of God? <clears throat> Is Joshua giving a challenge just like Elijah gave a challenge? Is this challenge not unlike that which was given by John the Baptist. Is this challenge not unlike the challenge presented by Father Miller? How long are you slack to possess the land? How long halt ye between two opinions? The promise has been made. You have seen what's occurred with Caleb. You have now seen the land drying up before your eyes with Elijah. Your gods of wood and stone cannot save you, but you're holding on to them. You're holding them as if they could do you good. How long do we want to hold on to the other interpretations of what the Bible says? Why are we not studying according to Father Miller? One of the, the comments that's been made to me multiple times is, hey, you have studied these, these portions. You have looked into this in scripture. You have done the work. Why don't you simplify the work and tell me how this is to be so that I can understand it, and I don't have to do the work. I'm not looking to become anybody else's priest. It is time that we point the way so that others can make the effort to pick up the promise that God has given so that they can they cannot any longer halt between two opinions is this not a warning message in line with the third angel of revelation 14 It seems like it to me. So if we begin looking at this and looking at the elements of these warnings with the warning of Revelation 14, will we not come to a clearer understanding of what righteousness by faith really means?
does this not help to sweep away the years of misconceptions that have been pushed upon us? Well, it certainly includes action, right? It does. Was an action not called for at the time of Elijah? Is an action not being called for here in Joshua 18, verse 3? I don't see how you can see it any other way. I agree. I mean, Joshua is being pointed. He's being direct. How long are you slack to go and to possess the land? What is it going to take for you to decide that you're going to take God at his word? Can we afford to be lazy in our studies to say that, oh, well, Theodore has done all this for us, or Jeff has done all this for us, or Father Miller has done all this for us. Don't we need to make this a personal situation? Don't we need to take the time and place the effort to possess the word, to make it our own? I mean, we're given, the, we're given Miller's rules for a reason just as we have been given the writings of Ellen White for a reason. I have many that I have known for years that have tried to tell me that Ellen White was a good person, but she was not a prophet. There's too many of her prophecies that have just not come to pass. Therefore, she's a false prophet. personal testimony again. I had times where I was down in a city near an Adventist institution of higher learning. I spoke with a lady that had attended academy about the same time that I had. She was so bitter with her parents because when she was younger, she had a time that she came home and she'd had her ears pierced. And her parents were so angry that they ripped the piercings, they ripped the earrings out of her ears and used Ellen White's writings as their reason for doing so. And to that day, her bitterness with her parents was also with Ellen White. Ellen White's words are not to be used as a club. They're not to beat people into submission, but we are to present what we understand. As we present, it leads to a choice. Do you agree? Or do you disagree? How long are you slack to go to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you? Give out from among you three men for each tribe. Here is this number again, the number three. And I will send them, and they shall rise and go through the land and describe it according to the inheritance of them, and they shall come again to me. So how many men total are being sent into the land? We have three men for each tribe. How many went out? 36. So... 
if 36 men have gone out, then we should be able to note that the three has an interrelationship with 36, that when they are investigating the land, that these three men from each tribe are also <clears throat> symbols, I would say, of the three angels' message. Would you have any thoughts different from that? Is there something else that this could symbolize for our time? Well, you have uh, 36 being a symbol of 666 as well. Okay. So you can maybe relate that to the Sunday law crisis. Okay. Where you have the third angel's message being proclaimed more fully. All right. Excellent point. Anyone else with thoughts or questions? Okay, Joshua 18.5. And they shall divide it into seven parts. Judah shall abide in their coast on the south, and the house of Joseph shall abide in their coasts on the north. So <clears throat> here, how many tribes are being represented in this verse? Be seven. Well, <clears throat> we have that they the 36 are going to divide the land into seven parts. But we have Judah that is to abide in their coast on the south. Judah is to abide within their borders. And the house of Joseph shall abide in their coasts on the north. How many tribes comprise the house of Joseph? Two tribes. So when he's describing the house of Joseph in conjunction with that of Judah, do we not have three tribes that are being addressed in this portion? That these are being shown as being joined in some manner? I guess what I'm trying to say is this not a, another representative another representation of the two sticks. Or am I off base? No, the handcuffs would, be, would apply. Yes. Okay. Now, when when they're referring here to Judah. The way that the translators had looked at this, they went back to Joshua 15, verse 1. Then was the lot of the tribe of the children of Judah by their families, even to the border of Edom, the wilderness of Zin southward, was the uttermost part of the south coast or the south border. And then when it's talking about the house of Joseph, we are given verses from Joshua 16, verses 1 and 4. And the lot of the children of Joseph fell from the Jordan by Jericho unto the water of Jericho on the east to the wilderness that goeth up from Jericho throughout Mount Bethel. So the children of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim, took their inheritance.
<clears throat> Joshua 18, verse 6. Ye shall therefore describe the land into seven parts, and bring the description hither unto me, that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. Joshua 14.2 and Joshua 18.10. By lot was their inheritance, as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses, for the nine tribes and for the half tribe. And Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord. And there Joshua divided the land unto the children of Israel according to their divisions. Here it's being pointed out that there were two tribes and a half, and then nine tribes and a half. Here again is the number 12. Joshua 18, verse 7. But the Levites have no part among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. And Gad and Reuben and half-tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance beyond Jordan on the east, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. Here it again, it is noted. Joshua 13, 33. But unto the tribe of Levi, Moses gave not any inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance, as he said unto them. Here is the tribe of Levi. Are they not providing a type, an example of the inheritance of the 144,000? For are not the 144,000 those that will follow the Lamb wherever he goeth? As the tribe of Levi was given the inheritance of the service in the tabernacle of God, where God himself was their inheritance, and this was their literal inheritance, Is this not the same as what the 144,000 will have as their inheritance in the kingdom to come? The second part of this verse, and Gad and Reuben and half the tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance beyond Jordan on the east, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. So is this verse saying that half of the tribe of Manasseh received the land to the east and that the other half would then receive land on the west. All of the, the maps that I've, I've referred to would seem to indicate this. I believe what we were studying about the daughters would seem to indicate this as well. Joshua 13 verse 8 is the verse that is used to support this with whom the Reubenites and the Gadites have received their inheritance, which Moses gave them, 
beyond the Jordan eastward, even as Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. <clears throat> Joshua 18, verse 8. And the men arose and went away, and Joshua charged them that went to describe the land, saying, Go and walk through the land and describe it, and come again to me, that I may here cast lots for you before the Lord in Shiloh. Go do the work. Go do as the Lord has commanded. Return, and we will see what the Lord would have us to do. Joshua 18, verse 9. And the men went and passed through the land and described it by cities into several seven parts in a book and came again to Joshua to the host at Shiloh. And Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord. And there Joshua divided the land unto the children of Israel according to their divisions. Joshua 18.11. And the lot of the tribe of the children of Benjamin came up according to their families. And the coast of their lot came forth between the children of Judah and the children of Joseph. And their border on the north side was from Jordan. And the border went up to the side of Jericho on the north side and went up through the mountains westward. And the goings out thereof were at the wilderness of Beth Avon. Now, this portion, we are told to see Joshua 16, verse 1. And the lot of the children of Joseph fell from Jordan by Jericho unto the water of Jericho on the east to the wilderness that go up from Jericho throughout Mount Bethel. Again, anytime that we see Beth, as part of a name of a location, we know that this is the house of something. Do we recall what Beth Avon was to be the house of? House of Farmaday. Okay, the meaning of the house of plenty. We're um, not house of idols. Really? But was not the children of Israel promised that this would be a land flowing with milk and honey? But we have a wilderness here, the wilderness of Beth Ava, the wilderness of the house of plenty. How can you have plenty and still have a wilderness? Uh, where are you getting your um, interpretation? I'm looking at a Byron publication right now. I've got several others that are open before me. Holman Bible Dictionary has Beth Avon showing house of deception or house of idolatry. Is that more in line with what you have? Yes. Okay. So if we look at this then and accept this as the house of idolatry or the house of deception, 
we can easily have a wilderness. Because if this is the house of deception, even if it's the house of plenty of deception, what does that describe for us today? Is it not a house that has turned its back upon the word of God? Is this not describing a house that is more reliant upon man, upon the creation, than they are upon the creator? What do we see here? Any other thoughts? Well, my thoughts came to the the woman that uh, enshrouds the word of God in her own language, in her own, in, in the, uh, in the um, garb of, of the uh, pagans. Okay. You know, she, she looks, she looks like uh, something people would, you know, like and 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 relate to the bible but inside she's actually still pagan yep now there are those that would that would try to say that the way that some of the things that i i have recently been led to present are very harsh. That when I am saying that we need to be placing personal effort into our studies, that I am rejecting when others are saying that, well, you've already studied this, you should simplify it. You should tell me what it says so that I may be saved, so that I don't have to put forth the effort because there's hundreds of these presentations. I'm not gonna approach it the way that Parminder and Tess did and say, you need to listen to these faster. Pick a subject, pick a topic, pick a book of the Bible. Look at it, study it, assess it for yourself. How else can we be eating the word if we are not willing to take the word as it is presented. Part of the reason that we're doing these studies is that we are coming together to compare. Now, just like what we just did, just in, in defining Beth Avon, we come together, we address these things together. Wisdom is not given just to one. All of this, all of us can be granted wisdom from the throne above. If we are willing to study, to compare, and to bring these things together so that we may come into an understanding that is in unity with our brothers and sisters.
Joshua 8, 13. And the border went over from thence toward Luz to the side of Luz, which is Bethel, southward. And the border described to Ataroth Adar, <clears throat> near the hill that lieth on the south side of the nether Beth Horon. Bethel was the place where Jacob came, where he used a rock as his pillow and was given the dream of the ladder that reached between earth and heaven. We can find this in scripture, in the book of Genesis. Here we're given these descriptions so that we might truly be able to understand the border of the literal tribe of Benjamin. But we may also be able to look upon the spiritual borders that we need to see of our experience. Any thoughts? Now, when we look at what the translators had used to the side of Laws. We come back to Genesis 28, 19. And he and Jacob called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. Along with Judges 1, 23. And the house of Joseph sent to de descry Bethel. Now the name of the city before was Luz. A question that I had asked before. When we see a name change, Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, Jacob to Israel, we have applied this as a covenant relationship because the name change signifies that that party is now entering into covenant with God. Does the same thing apply here when the name of a city is changed? And this is a thought question. I think we're going to have to answer this for ourselves. Now, identifying the nether, go ahead. Identifying the south side of the nether, Beth Horon. We are told to give reference to Joshua 16.3. And goeth westward to the coast of Japheli or Japhleti, sorry, unto the coast of Beth Haran, the nether, and to Gezer, and the goings out thereof are at the sea. Joshua 8, 14. And the border was drawn thence and compassed the corner of the sea southward, from the hill that lieth before Beth Haran southward, and the goings out thereof were at Kirjath Baal, which is Kirjath Jerem, a city of the city of Judah. This was the west quarter. Here again, Joshua 15, verse 9. And the border was drawn from the top of the hill unto the fountain of the water of 
Nephtoa and went out to the cities of Mount Ephraim. And the border was drawn to Bela, which is Kirjath Jerem. And the south quarter was from the end of Kirjath Jerem. And the border went out to the west and to the waters of Nephtoa. And the border came down to the end of the mountain that lieth before the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is in the valley of the giants on the north, and descended to the valley of Hinnom, to the side of Jebusi on the south, and descended to En Rogel. So this border is to the side of Jebusi, where the Jebusites live, which is Jerusalem. And was drawn from the north and went forth to En Shemesh and went forth toward Galiloth, which is over against the going up of Adumim and descended to the stone of Bohan, the son of Reuben. And it passed along toward the side over against Arba northward and went down unto Arba. Arba is also being shown as being the plain in the alternate reading. And the border passed along to the side of Beth Hogla northward. And the outgoings of the border were at the north bay of the Salt Sea at the south end of Jordan. This was the south coast. And Jordan was the border of it on the east side. This was the inheritance of the children of Benjamin by the coast thereof round about according to their families. Now we've gotten in, we have identified the extent for the children of Benjamin. We know that this extent lies to the east of the Jordan, or excuse me, to the west of the Jordan, and is north of that of Judah. Benjamin, the final son of Jacob and Raquel, is given a territory that is very much landlocked, but does border on what we currently call the Dead Sea. So this tribe is now going to be identified and there's going to be some very specific points that will come out in the next seven verses as we address the cities of Benjamin but we are coming close to the end of our time. What thoughts do you have based upon the verses that we have covered today? Any comments or any questions? Okay, what the plan is going to be then for tomorrow, we are going to assess Joshua 18, verse 21 and forward. Hang on. <coughs> Excuse me. We will then 
when we have gone through these verses, we will then begin in Joshua 19. <clears throat> I believe that Joshua 19 is Sister Angela. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Are you ready? Yes, I am, hopefully. Good. I'm looking forward to your presentation. So we will deal tomorrow with the balance here of Joshua 18. We will then be looking forward to Sister Angela's presentation on Joshua 19. Any comments as we prepare to close? Okay. Shall we close with prayer? Heavenly Father, we need you. We need your guidance. We need your direction as we proceed through this day. Please bless us, Father, and show us that which we may do that will give a representation of your character to all of those with whom we come in contact. Direct us this day. We lift up Theodore and Heidi in prayer. We ask, Father, that you be with them, that your arms encircle them. We thank you for those that were able to be here this morning. We missed many. We ask today for your blessing upon them as well. Direct us now, show us that which you would have us to do. For this we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.